Hello and welcome to this second episode of Thinking Like X by Think. Uh, I am Madhav. In this episode, Mohanan, Tara and I, all members of Think, are joined by Suveer Saran. Suveer is a Michelin-starred chef uh, for his restaurant Devi in New York. He has spent most of his career in the US before returning to India a few years ago. Apart from being a chef, Suveer is a writer, a restaurateur, a farmer, on the advisory board of Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard, amongst many other things. While this episode is focused on thinking like a chef, many of Savir's other avatars come up during the discussion. Parts of this episode, especially towards the end, are very personal and really give us a sense of who Savir is. As you will see, there are many aspects of being a chef which generalize far outside that particular domain. Talking after the recording, Mohanan Tara and I saw various connections between the discussion in this episode and the previous one, thinking like a theoretical linguist. If you have had the chance to listen to both of these, you might enjoy reflecting on the commonality between these apparently distinct domains. We hope you enjoy this episode. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app for future episodes. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, I'm here with uh, fellow Think Team members Mo and Tara and uh, Savir Sharan, uh, a Michelin starred chef, restaurateur, act- author, educator, consultant, public speaker, and farm advocate. He clearly does a lot of stuff. Uh, however, as you've probably surmised from the title, today we want to focus on thinking like a chef. However, other aspects of his work and life will almost certainly enter our discussion today. I will be recording a longer introduction to Severe, which all of you have probably heard uh, already. Uh, however, for now, let's jump in. Um, so, Severe, as an entry point into the question of how you go about thinking like a chef, I'm going to start by asking you, what made you want to be a chef? Life made me into a chef. I grew up wanting to be an artist, a visual artist or a doctor. And somewhere in between, I also thought I'd be a veterinarian because I love animals and also wanted to be a a classical Hindustani vocalist. So those were the uh, loves of my life. And I would have been very happy being any one of those four things, a doctor, an artist, or a classical musician or a veterinarian. But I arrived in America after a detour from Delhi to Bombay to study at the School of Visual Arts. I landed in New York City at the Sorry, in Bombay at the JJ School of Art. I landed in New York at the School of Visual Arts, where I studied uh, fine arts and graphic design with a focus on art history as well. And as I studied in New York City, I also worked a full-time job first at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in their retail store, being a stock boy. But what I did every day before I uh, left home for work was to cook something Indian or even a sweet meat, a pastry of some sorts, and bring it to work to share with my uh, co-workers. And reputation uh, spread that Suveer Saran is this creature that cooks amazing food, not just Indian. And he also has the ability to work full-time, go to school full-time, and cook full-time. And uh, one thing led to the other, and people started telling me to come cater parties at their homes gratis as a friend. And soon I got a call from a woman called Elizabeth Miller whose husband, Stephen Weissman, in those days was the, this is early 1990s, was on the editorial board of the New York Times. And she said, Stephen's turning 50. And we used to both live in India. She, he was the New York Times correspondent in India, and she was the Washington Post correspondent in India. So they loved Indian food, and they'd heard I was, uh, Suveer Saran was the hottest caterer in town for Indian food. I'd never catered a meal. So she called me through a friend of ours, a common friend, and said, would you please cater this birthday? And I said, how many people? She said, uh, around 100. And I said, you know, what day? And she gave me, she said, I'm hiring you. I said, I've never done this for pay. She said, well, you'll do it now. And that's how I became a caterer while doing a full-time job and going to school. And then one thing led to the other and several other such opportunities came about. And in 1996, for the 50th anniversary of India's independence, Carnegie Hall uh, was being used as the spot where musicians and dancers from India would come and do classical music and dance festival. 
and they were uh, auditioning chefs from across the world to come into the first indian style meal cooked at the observed at the rohinton room at carnegie hall and different people applied and i did too and i got the gig and the next thing i knew i was uh, by dessert of a pineapple passion fruit mango mousse with a nest of bird's nest made with candied mango peel and then uh, pomegranate seeds as eggs in the nest made it to the front cover of the new york magazine and i was called the hottest caterer in town and um, my uh, boss at the time i used to be working in retail at uh, henry bendel um, gave me severance and said go take a year take two years if you hate the industry come back and here's your salary for that time and go cook and i said what are you doing and he fired me with a sweet package and said go live cook and share your uh, brilliance with the world and that led me into becoming a cooking teacher and from there my reputation grew and people started coming to me for catering and teaching and uh, consulting and the next thing i knew um somebody gave me money and said why don't you open a restaurant for us and i opened uh once uh, first i consulted in a restaurant called amma and then i opened devi which when the michelin guide came to new york city for the first time in 2004 or 5 i'm forgetting the date right now but i was one of the first 18 chefs in america to get a michelin star and the first one that wasn't northern european to get it so a series of accidents or uh, uh, good lucks and just being in the right place at the right time doing the right thing led to me being a chef it wasn't something i planned to do from what you've said um and from what i've read and heard about you and the recipes i've seen of yours beyond traditional dishes you create new dishes where you put together ingredients from different cuisines which to someone who's not a chef um don't seem obvious bedfellows for instance there is this recipe of yours of uh, deviled eggs with sambar powder right so about this i have a slightly longish and elaborate question now when you are designing a dish how do you go about it i'm not talking about creating a recipe i'm talking about just the creation of the dish i can think of various possibilities one is do you think about which ingredients go together and plan what you're going to do or do you have some taste or flavor in mind something you've eaten somewhere or imagined or remember and perhaps a feel on your tongue from which then you work backwards and find ingredients to put together to create that or do it, you, sorry no no carry on okay or do you have some um you know a taste or flavor in mind um that creates this or um do you take a dish and change it change an existing dish that you enjoy that make it more suited to your taste or maybe you need a dish in a hurry and you look at what's available and the dish creates itself or maybe you do all of these or something entirely different from all of these um, so tara yes. i think you've um, you've painted the perfect canvas in which a chef would operate <laughs> but i'm the most imperfect chef and imperfect or perfect imperfect human being that um, i don't fit into any box of intelligence creativity genius or extraordinariness i uh, as i said i just all kinds of happenstance and accidents have led me to where i am i'm very mindful of where i am what i am what i'm not and of my talents and my lack of them so i live each day grabbing what life sends my way and so if i'm standing somewhere or sitting or reading or writing or observing if something speaks to me i grab it and then i study it and as i study it and another thing tells me i'm a plate use me and the other thing that had talked to me was an egg and the third thing that i was craving was sambar powder or a uh, uh, you know mora koiramba or something from southern india that's telling me remember mudliyar aunty used to make this and if eight conversation in my head are happening at the same time about eight different things that are harmonious in some connection to each other i then start going into the kitchen and playing and life guides you into doing the right thing because often times those memories those tastes those sounds those visual clues are all coming from a place of cohesiveness 
and then they find their way onto the table. Most often dishes in my head begin by a plate or a bowl or a cooking dish or a, a vessel telling me, pick me up and I have something to teach you. And then what they take me down is memory lane and nostalgia and Indian history and tradition and the traditions of the world. And they all come together and inform me into being a mindful cook, a mindful chef, a mindful dishwasher and a mindful artist because they tell me what to do rather than me telling them what to do. And that's how alchemy happens in my kitchen. I'm no, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a trained chef, so I never had a technique that gu uh, guided me. I let life guide me. So that's my teacher. And I always tell my chefs that none of us live in uh, vacuum uh, packed bags that we can come out of nowhere and say, this is created by me. Life, if we live mindfully with open eyes and open ears and with a nose that can smell and a, uh, hands that can uh, touch and feel, we've all been informed every day that we've lived. So to say we've created something is very pompous and perhaps other people can create, I can't. But I've, I've assimilated over the years and I share my discoveries with, of course, my uh, style and my uh, sense of um, uh, 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 pizzazz and uh, the je ne sais quoi that you can't really pinpoint. But I do share the uh, life I've lived and the associations I've had and the discoveries I've made in every bite that I've feed people. So actually, uh, so as an aside, aside from this, uh, so you said you didn't go to culinary school. Um, so if you were to, uh, but, but you've, you've dealt with a lot of chefs who did go to culinary school. If you were to design a program to educate potential young chefs, uh, would that be any different from what culinary school looks like currently from what you've seen from, of culinary school? Culinary education, like uh, almost all education, is um, linear in many ways. And so that's both a gift and a shortcoming. Not all students learn that way. Um, but like any art that is a little more subjective than just black and white, the culinary arts have to be learned through practice more than just by rote or by study. You have to get your hands dirty, you have to cook, you have to uh, eat, you have to travel, you have to uh, pay obeisance to a tradition in a culture, immerse yourself in it before you can say, I've learned how to cook. And uh, reading a book can teach you techniques. Uh, the instruction from a chef can tell you what the benchmarks are, but it doesn't teach you how to taste. It doesn't teach you how to uh, pick a vegetable and know when it's ripe. It doesn't teach you how to cook till the onions are perfectly caramelized brown because that experience teaches you. And that comes from getting your hands dirty and saying, I'm going to go stage with a great chef or a great home cook that has cooked that one particular dish for decades and they've perfected it. I'll go be their slave in their kitchen and say, I'll wash your dishes, I'll massage your feet, I'll massage your back, I'll worship at your altar, teach me your tricks. That's the best way of learning. And those chefs who do that, are uh, uh, leaps and bounds ahead of the chefs that just learn in a school. But that said, at the Culinary Institute of America, world cuisine uh, is now ruling uh, over the traditional Northern European cuisines that in India we call Conti cooking. That's a cuisine that's dead to the planet. The French don't eat that rubbish anymore that Indian five-star hotels are still serving. It's, you know, the world is hungry for flavor. The world is hungry for stories being told through recipes that are being served on a plate. And to do that storytelling, to uh, cook food that sings and dances with each flavor that people taste, you have to understand traditions, know about the masters that make a certain dish, understand the cultures from where they come from, have a context to each dish that you're making. And that comes from having a journey that you put into your uh, métier, your uh, passion, your vocation. And that doesn't come from either a classroom or a textbook, but comes from... Uh, uh, sense of commitment to your passion and uh, uh, the co-curricular activity that you can indulge in while you go to school. And some schools like the Culinary Institute of America are now sending kids for four, six month stages so they can go learn from these masters, travel in a different culture and come back even more impassioned to learn the culinary arts and techniques and then translate them into beautiful food. You kind of, can I ask you, kind of emphasized mindfulness and uh, nature and memory also 
but in your memory there must be certain kinds of constraints so when some voice speaks you also mention cohesiveness and there is a voice saying such and such and there is another voice saying such and such other things there must be something in your memory that says oh those two things can combine those two other things cannot combine so for ingredient 1 uh you put and then you you are thinking of ingredient 2 versus 3 and then you say ha huh, one and two can combine but one and three cannot combine there must be something in your memory something in your knowledge that gives you these constraints on combinability of different ingredients or different tastes H- how would you how would you use that in teaching so uh, mohanan i grew up knowing from the age of 3 that i was a gay man there was nothing that i was told that i ever held sacrosanct everything that they told me went against the grain of my very being and fabric society that i saw growing up in india was an anathema to who i was as a human being so early on in my life i learned that don't believe everything people tell you rules are meant to be broken and in breaking those rules is the true joy of living so i've never allowed any constraints to inform who i am i i always uh, am the devil's advocate i always take the contrarian view i always do why if people are telling me to do x so i've never b- believed mm. in following the straight and narrow path i always tell people that there's no straight path i always move gaily forward so you know i'm always playing the uh, uh, impish uh, clown in any straight gathering so similarly in my cooking i never 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 ever allowed history time people to tell me what cannot be done of course i respect love adore find comforting find yummy and delicious a lot of the old recipes that i've enjoyed with people across my lifetime and what they've told me existed before theirs but i enjoy them but i don't let them guide me into not breaking rules because if i see things growing together if i see things in a market that are together in a uh, in a road side stand what they say in italy is what grows together is happy together i believe that and i play with them and often times what i make somebody will tell me oh my grandmother used to make a dish similar to this so what is one person's rules are often broken by another set of people's rules because you know we are all creatures of habit and sometimes our habits mislead us into believing that the possibilities are fewer than what we imagine so if you really want to create magic in the kitchen mm. you have to let go of all those uh, rules that we've been given because if your taste buds have a sense of mindfulness your mouth will never let you make accidents happen and an accident only happens if you're not willing to learn in that moment from it and correct it to something else that it should be so i always tell my chefs that hello there's no accident happening in a kitchen be mindful a mistake teaches you what never to repeat again and what to guard for and what you can do instead so there's always you you're learning on the fly and what you're learning is how to be a better you every time you cook and those what be some people may call them mistakes other call them um, a discovery b practice and uh, three the creation of a new dish so uh, if you keep playing magic happens as you go on Yeah, i i agree i agree that uh, it's not necessary to obey somebody else's rules but uh, in the course of your cooking uh, in the course of your own evolution are there rules that or constraints that you have created on your own through your experience when you describe this as your mouth telling you or you know your mind telling you nature telling you uh, true there, there is something i've learned uh, mohanan carry on so those will be those those are the kinds of constraints that uh, that um i was talking about something that emerges from your own evolution something certain things that make you who you are so something as, that makes your dish different from somebody else's dish true i think uh, as i now i'm 47 years old i started cooking when i was 18 out of as i left home I was also cooking from the age of 5 or 6. I'm every living relative and friend of my mom and ours tells me that when I was 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, I was teaching them a dish or cooking with them or uh, informing them of a recipe they needed to practice better. So I've cooked from a young age but I didn't start cooking for me till the age of 18. Uh 
Um, what I've learned at 47, and I tell my chefs with a little bit of restlessness when I see them doing certain things. And I, so in some ways, I'm being a bad boy and constraining them from doing their own discovery. I tell them if there's any one thing I can teach them is less is more. So, you know, sometimes if you give somebody a uh, hundred um, colors, crayons of different hues and shades, some artists think using all hundred is very essential. And a brilliant artist often is the one that may take four or five and make just incredible, uh, amazing brilliance come out with just four or five of those uh, crayons given to them. And I tell our sh my chefs that sometimes holding back and letting a few ingredients shine is more important than putting every ingredient that you can think of, all the new trends, all the new fads, and everything, you're, all the noise in the industry you're trying to put into a, a, a bowl or a plate or a, a, a pot, that's not necessary. And that's something you learn with experience. Some of us, others may think it's essential to make noise on a plate. I think sometimes a harmonious melody is uh, much more pleasing and sustainably delicious than a cacophonous, uh, blustery, loud uh, taste of flavors that dies soon after it's been uh, shared. So I think that's what I've learned in my 47 years, that editing out yourself and all your instincts is often better than uh, just going with every instinct your brain has. You know, the plumbing uh, between the brain and the hands has to sometimes be held back, that you have impulses that not every impulse has to be acted upon. And uh, so holding back, being a little measured, being... Uh, an economy of scale if you're cooking is more important than just a, an economy of abundance. That's what I've learned in my 47 years. Very interesting. Okay. Yes. That, Does yeah, that yeah. answer your question, yeah, Mohan? Absolutely. Or? That kind of describes who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, but Mohan, and one more, one more minute. One more thing. In Italy, they romanticize that very beautifully. And the term is cucina mm. povera the cuisine of poverty. And I always tell our chefs that poverty was the mother of invention. When you had less, you created more out of nothing. When you have abundance, you often have no joy because there's so much you've forgotten how to appreciate brilliance. So it goes back to the roots, cucina povera, the cuisine of poverty, the mother of invention. So, uh, so Savir, a little while ago, you talked about um, storytelling through your uh, food. Um, so... When you're, when you're creating a meal, that's a little more than just a collection of dishes, right? It has to kind of work together. There's a various things which it has to achieve. Uh, how do you go about achieving a meal rather than just a set of dishes? I never cook dishes. I cook um, memories. And um, if you are a successful home cook, if you're a successful businessman, a retailer, a singer, a uh, a uh, crochet artist, a uh, painter, if you're just painting, knitting, crocheting, uh, embroidering, because you're doing an act, you, you are who you are. But if to become beyond that, you have to believe that what you're doing is uh, leaving lasting memories that can either be appreciated and be immortal to your mortal um, mind, body and soul. And if you believe in that, then you, you just don't cook dishes. You're, create, you're serving memories in every plate you do. And believing in that, I look at seasonality, regionality, my own mood, and uh, the surroundings I'm serving in, and what we are celebrating. And if there's a, uh, in that particular week or month, is there a celebration that's happening in the world that is noteworthy to me or the people I'm cooking to, cooking for and uh, sitting and eating with? All of that comes into my decision making as I get into the kitchen. And then, of course, the harmony of ingredients, what's the freshest in the market? Are there uh, certain condiments that are so perfectly ripe at that particular moment that if I put them on the table, what would be the dishes that go with them that would make most sense in serving? So to, with whom you're eating, where you're eating, how you are eating, how you are serving, and uh, when and where. All of that comes together to with whom, to whom, when and where and how. All of, they, all of those play a very important role 
in deciding what you cook at a particular given moment. You have to satisfy your own um, cravings. You have to be satisfied as a chef cooking in the kitchen that I did the best I could. And then you have to make sure that all that sit at your table to eat think that what you served is uh, brilliant too. So, you know, you have to, uh, the food critic of New York Magazine, Gail Green, perhaps the greatest diva of American uh, food criticism, uh, in one of her reviews of me said, Sweet Saran has a, a caterer's palate. And I was rather offended that I was a caterer 15 years ago. Why is she calling me a caterer now? And I called up Gail. I said, Gail. So she said, didn't you love the review? I said, why did you call me a caterer? I'm now a chef. She said, darling, you are a chef, but you're a caterer too. I said, but what do you mean by I'm a caterer too? She said, not everybody can cater to every person's uh, satiety. And I said, and? She said, your palate is so refined that if there were 100 people eating, 95 will be pleased with your palate. Other chefs can cook for the 40 groupies that come every day to eat their food and they love their food. 45 others will hate it because they just don't know how to make a lot of people happy. They focus on one. She said, your palate looks to please everybody like a puppy dog does everybody in a room. I was like, ready to smack her and then I got her point. But, you know, sometimes to please the most number of people, you have to understand that uh, it's not about your own genius, your own ego. It's about you're leaving most people you touch in your lives with a memory. And if you work hard on just stretching beyond your comfort zone, you may hit the spot for many more people. And it's so if you let your ego go away by thinking that everything you have to do has to reach A+, plus, somewhere in that B plus to A range, you can create food that makes many more people happy. So as a chef who uh, understands humanity, as a human being who is um, not selfish, you have to you then translate your food to be like that, a little more ecumenical, a little more uh, uh, pleasing to all. So I get into the kitchen thinking I have to get 90 out of 100 people happy and what will be the comforting dishes for most of them and then I decide my menu. So, so you're looking for that, you, you, no, you're not looking for, but you achieve that perfect alignment. Wonderful. Um, I, if I could ask... Not always. Question, not not always. always. No. <laughs> I think that's what life teaches you. We, we yes. strive for it. Yes. And, <laughs> and that's all we can do. At the end of... I, um, I feel lucky that I was born to a Hindu household. I let religion not come into my professional realm because we are so we can easily divide us into isms mm -hmm. but personally i love the, the vedic way of living because i do my best and let the world do uh, judge it as they wish but i know that i've given it my best and i leave it at that but i strive to make the most people most of the people that i serve happy and if i can great if not i try harder the next time around but i each time i cook i cook to please the most great uh, if I could ask something that's completely different from this, um, yeah, on, on your website, um, you say that you are a farm advocate. What is a farm advocate and what brought you to becoming one? Um, could you say something about that? And my uh, website is now one year old in being uh -huh. updated, so my apologies. Um, <laughs> for, for almost 15 years, my partner Charlie and I lived on a farm in upstate New York in a town called Hebron. And mm -hmm. it was the Vermont, New York border where mm -hmm. life is uh, as rugged as you can imagine life to be, minus 20 degrees for six months. And that's 20, minus 20 Fahrenheit. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, we appreciated what uh, life sends our way, sent our way. And we appreciated what we had in New York City when we were at the farm. And as being advocates of farming, we, Charlie and I, uh, did our best to talk about the vagaries of life as uh, lived, seen, and endured by people in rural communities. Because a lot of city dwellers love organic and natural and farm fresh. But there's what we call in uh, New York farm to fable. That, you know, the farm to table is mostly all kinds of uh, BS storytelling. When the how can you have sustainable farming when the poor man farming for you is still uh, mostly illiterate uh, without access to 21st century amenities that city dwellers take for granted? 
and then we wonder why Donald Trump is uh, running uh, America as president. That there's a dichotomy between the lives of the city dwellers and the lives of true rural farmers. So we were advocates bringing to American city uh, folk, urban dwellers, the uh, uh, both the beauty and the uh, uh, sadness of life around farming. Because we have corporate farming, which is uh, amazingly brilliant in terms of industrialization, but it's also uh, stripped land of any uh, human uh, uh, decency and vision. It's just draping the planet of uh, the uh, our natural resources and also uh, marauding humanity that comes in its way. So having an 80-acre farm where we grew, uh, we, we raised 200 chickens, 100 ducks and geese, and uh, 36 plus alpacas, and a partridge and a pear tree, and a vegetable garden. We learned that farming wasn't as sexy and chic and interesting as it People uh, think it is. It's a hard job. It's a rugged job. It's a back-breaking job, and it takes more than a village to make a farm come together. And it's a twenty-four-seven challenge. A little too much snow, and you uh, ruin. You are one year of uh, 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 debt to your name. So you know, any one storm can uh, just take away all that you'd worked for over a season. And then you're in the uh, deep uh, uh, water for the next year. So it's not an easy thing to do. And yet people think it's so sexy and chic, but don't care where their product is coming from. Labels. We educated people on what truly organic or natural meant. I, we had an orga- a natural farm, but we were feeding animals organically. We called it humane and natural because if an animal at our farm was sick, I cared for them like I would care for my elderly mother and our friends and neighbors. So when the animal got sick, we invited the vet. The vet came to the farm, took care of them. We put them into a we, what we call the uh, nursing barn or the dispensary barn. It's there that the animals were brought in when they were sick. After they got fine, they were then at that same barn for three or four more weeks till any antibiotics in their body had been uh, depleted out of them. And then they went back to join the flock. So we took care of the lives we were entrusted to care for. And we provided for them even when they were sick. Organic farming means you buy organic grain, put a chicken in a cage, don't let it fly, but give it, stuff its mouth with organic uh, grain and then sell it in the market as organic uh, chicken, organic eggs for five times the price and just maybe five or ten times worse scared at the farm. So mindfulness, again, going back to Mohanan's word of uh, thinking that I use the word mindful, at the end of the day, as farm advocates, we were teaching people to be mindful of what they were asking for, what they were demanding for, what they were buying and where and uh, uh, when it was coming to their table, from where and when it was, so that the seasonality, the sourcing, the uh, uh, political aspect of food industry and the fads should all be uh, looked at with a magnifying glass before we go behind them. So we, uh, as a chef who was living the farming reality, I would bring to the chefs and tell them, guys, we can serve farm to fable food and lie that everything is 200 uh, miles or less. But then where's the lemon coming from? Where are the spices coming from? Where's the tamarind paste coming from? It's not all local and natural. So we have to be more honest and say we'll try to be as uh, sustainable, as local, as regional as possible. But then, of course, to bring flavor and to uh, crave our uh, craving, to sate our cravings, we have to break those rules as well. So as a farm advocate, we brought reality to the realm of cooking. You talked about how uh, your how, how how it was ru- uh, running a farm and advocating for a farm, um, and you did start touching on uh, how owning a farm in, impacted your cooking. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? How it impacted how you actually went about um, creating stuff? It, was this Madhav? Yeah, Madhav. Um... The, it was a farm where I learned to cook with uh, cook more with less, because the closest grocery store to our farm was a grocery store of any uh, uh, gravitas, where ingredients were truly decent, was um, almost twenty miles away, and there were certain ingredients we would have to go two hundred miles to get. 
so it we had to think we had to create we had to do with less and we were stuck in the middle of nowhere so if we had cravings that were uh, deeply rooted in my uh, indian memory i had to be 200 miles from humanity and still be able to uh, sate those cravings so at the farm i learned how to use what was available make substitution with ingredients that were nowhere closely related to the ingredients i was i needed to create uh, to sate my cravings and i realized that you know balsamic vinegar can do the work of good old balsamic vinegar can do the work of uh, tamarind chutney when uh, put to the in the use the right way and um, you realize that there are many substitutions that you can do if you are if your eyes are open your taste buds are ready to discover and you are put into a, a desert with uh, no oasis anywhere in sight so that's what the farm taught me that we we became very clever cooks charlie and i and our home was the grand central station of uh, uh, the back of beyond so even though we lived in a town with no more than 500 people in a landmass that may have been a 50 mile radius our home was packed with people we could be hosting 150 people for dinner that I, i and charlie had cooked together or we could be hosting a couple for a, a weekend where they had paid Twenty thousand dollars to come spend a weekend at our home to a charity, and we would be cooking meals that they thought were the most memorable morsels they'd eaten in a lifetime. So we were serving fanciful food to country fare, to uh, classic Indian cooking, all in the middle of nowhere. Because we stocked our pantry very well, I learned how to keep a pantry, a larder, a, a, a cellar, all uh, uh, perfectly. Uh, full of stuff charlie kept a diary of what was being used would then make a list of what was missing it brought order to our lives it taught us how to create with less and it taught us the rigor and discipline of thinking about what we are doing the next minute not just taking it for granted that oh, order on amazon same day delivery will bring it to us within an hour so we learned not to be capricious and uh, uh, just think off the fly we had to be planning our lives a little better and we had to teach ourselves to deliver with less interesting in in responding to mother you talked about your craving and uh, uh, you also mentioned something like replacing balsamic vinegar sorry tamarind with balsamic vinegar so i was wondering do you do cooking in your mind let me explain my uh, our daughter is a dancer and she does what she calls mental dance and when i want to give a talk i often do that talk in my mind when i'm having a shower uh sometimes i play ping pong in my mind do you cook in your mind do i i cook up i cook up mischief i cook up recipes i guess in my mind i do yeah i think we all do i think um, yes i do i would be lying if i said i don't because um at breakfast i'm already thinking of what i want to eat for lunch at lunch i'm thinking about what i may want for a snack in the evening and as i'm eating that snack i'm thinking about what i'm cooking for dinner and at dinner i'm thinking about the meals i should have cooked during the day that would have been even better than what i cooked so yes i do cook in my mind like your daughter dances in her mind and you ping pong in your head so i think we all we all of us are passionate about certain things and we do uh, indulge them in our head and i'm no different yes uh, what would be great now is if you could tell us a bit about what you're doing now what your plans are for the future uh, um uh what what is uh, what what is your journey going forward from here you know i came to india um in 2000 mid 2018 to 2019 i had uh, suffered a stroke in new york and i had seven concussions that made me go blind in my right eye and i could see 5 feet in my left eye and um i'd lost 65 plus pounds and um i was pretty much told i had a few weeks or a month or so and i should tell my family that's when i told them and that the doctors could understand what was going wrong with me that i kept falling and damaging my brain and uh, when there was no hope uh, charlie my mother my family they decided that india would be the place i should come to and that point i couldn't argue with them or fight them because there wasn't much left of me to fight anybody for anything i barely could walk without help 
and so I landed up in India and my family and our friends, there was this uh, chef friend of mine, Gunjan Bansal, who runs in Delhi, a kitchen called Panda Walk and another uh, kebabs and uh, rolls. So Gunjan just said to me, you know, you're here. Why don't you come? Let's open something together or just come work in my kitchen. Because she realized that just being sick wasn't making me any healthier. I was dying because of a lack of um, uh, something to do in my life. And that's what was killing me quicker than I should have died because I, the inability to see made me handicapped beyond I needed to be. And that lack of will to live was from not being able to do the things I loved. So when she gave me that offer to come cook in her kitchen, I went every day and I would cook one dish and I would share it with her chefs and they would all watch me cook. And they were so kind and encouraging that they kept me going. And then I had a, a cousin-in-law, a friend of mine, a cousin, Smita in Noida, that I went and cooked every, almost every day in Noida, I went and cooked a dish or two with this uh, sister-in-law of mine. And even though I could barely, she would hold me, she would chop for me because I could just give instruction or encourage somebody to cook. But they valued that. And all of that made me keep getting better. The man who was to die kept getting better and is now living a year and a half later. So uh, I came to India to die. I came to India to make peace with not having more life to live. And I've lived. And in the meantime, I, uh, another friend said, let's open a restaurant together in Gurgaon. So we opened the House of Celeste on 32nd Avenue in uh, uh, Gurgaon. And that opened uh, end of last year. And we were still in our pre-opening, soft opening phase when COVID-19 made all the restaurants in the area uh, shut down by a diktat of the government. So we are now closed till we open again. And so at the House of Celeste, the food was uh, progressive Indian. Um, people who had the good luck of dining there, who I had the good luck of feeding before we uh, were shut down by COVID, all came to say that there wasn't another food like that in India. It's just... Indian food uh, cooked by an Indian who's Indian in the 21st century. And it uh, represents my and my team of chefs and uh, uh, my team of front of the house employees who've come together to give a very 21st century Indian dining experience to diners in India and the ones that visit. That's uh, India that happens to be living mindfully in this moment of time. So our food is rooted in history. It's as old as India, but also as young as India. So uh, you can have golgappas that don't resemble a golgappa at all, but when you put them in your mouth and you bite in them, you're like, wow, it's a golgappa. But it looks like a chocolate sitting in a bed of dirt with a flower sitting on top of it. But when you bite into it, this burst of uh, water comes into your mouth that you hadn't expected, and you're like, wow, it's the tastiest golgappa I've ever eaten. So some parts of science in 21st century molecular gastronomy meeting ancient Indian traditions, come onto a plate, serve with a smile, with a nod to the 21st century, deeply rooted in the centuries past. That's what we are doing at the restaurant there. And the, uh, I've committed several years to India because India gave me the good luck of living when nobody expected I would. So I'm here to stay for a while. I've moved my two dogs, a 65-kilo dog and a 60-kilo dog, and my 27 years of belongings from America in a 70-foot container from the U.S. that arrived here. So I've set up home in Delhi, and I am hoping to open a restaurant in uh, Delhi. I'm consulting in a hotel project in Shimla, and um, there are, I, I, I write a weekly, a fortnightly column for India Today, and I have other uh, a daily that's talking to me about writing more often. So I'm here. I'm here. I'm here to stay, and I am enjoying living here, and I love how Indians help, support, and nurture one another. Uh, the challenges of India are incredibly more than I've ever faced in my 27 years abroad of living every day in India. But um, the love and the support and the uh, camaraderie that Indians give one another is uh, parallel to none. And that's what makes me smile at the end of every day. And my employees are amazing. My business partners are encouraging me. My employees are encouraging me to be their mentor. Uh, they give me respect and uh, admiration and adoration that I've never found in my years abroad. And so I feel even more motivated to uh, be step up and be a better teacher and be a better adult around them and hopefully inspire them to be the 
change makers of Indian cuisine tomorrow that will create the next butter chickens and dal makhnis of Indian cuisine, which we need badly if we want our cuisine to ever evolve into world-class cuisine. Butter chicken and dal ch- makhni and paneer makhni are not dishes that will ever get us the nod that our food needs from the world at large. These are comforting dishes, perhaps, but dishes that don't uh, uh, deserve more credit than the world gives them. And I think as Indians, we need to go back to our history and find uh, more uh, brilliant dishes of our Indian home traditions to uh, put on an exalted plate and serve with pride. The day we can serve a uh, Bharma Karela with a proud face and with the heroism of a star is the day Indian cuisine would have come of age and become at par with the Michelin star cuisines of the world and maybe the Michelin guide will finally come to India. Till then, we are just nodding our heads to the colonists, colonized version of their own history. The colonizers have left India, but the colonized mindset still thinks butter chicken and uh, dal makhni are the length and breadth of Indian cuisine. So it's my hope that I can break these stereotypes and bring Indians back to India and back to respecting their mother cuisine rather than the bastardized versions of their own cuisine that they think are very fancy and meet the world's expectations. Can I ask you a question? Um, what is the situation with your eyes at this point? I see, and I see a world that I often wish I wasn't seeing. <laughs> 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 I, um, my eyes have come back. And so concussions can leave people blind or uh, una- unable, to, unable to hear or read or write for two, three, four years. And mine came back in 11 months. I still have issues with my memory every now and then, but I seem to know those issues. People can't grab them, I'm told. But there'll be a word. If I'm the word autochthonous, it took me five days to remember it, and I couldn't tell anybody what word I was thinking about. If I knew the word, I would have said it. And everybody, my friends, my mom, they all said, what word, what word? After five days, it came out of my mouth, autochthonous, and I was smiling that finally the word that I was looking for for five days came to me. So... uh, there are newer words are uh, more difficult to come back to my memory than the old words. So anything I learned 10 years ago uh, and before, I remember easily. Things I learned in the last 10 years coming back a little slower. But um, I'm functioning at, I would say, 90% of what I used to be before I fell seven times and damaged my head. I, uh, if somebody didn't know I got sick, they won't think I was. And uh, I can't still sign my name very clearly. My signature changes with each check I uh, sign. The bank often argues with me that it's not my signature. And I have to tell them, guys, that I'm signing is a miracle. I really can't do more than that. So be happy with whatever I sign. But writing hasn't come back. But on the computer, I can I do type almost six to eight hours a day. I read, I write six to eight hours every day. So I never lost my ability to write on a phone or a computer. There's something about the uh, brain that uh, people who suffer uh, 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 from, uh, again, you know, because this I suffered two years ago, I've lost the word Stroke? to it. Aphasia. 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 Yes. We, we aren't able to read, write, or uh, 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 hear as easily, but typing on the phone or the computer doesn't go away. So I will, even when I couldn't write, when I couldn't read, I could type on the phone. And that was the brilliance of having a neurological disorder nobody understands. That I couldn't read or uh, write or uh, uh, hear, but I could uh, type on the phone or the computer. It teaches you to live very, uh, with a lot of gratitude and with a lot of um, respect. And my, uh, I uh, am ashamed of myself that I was such a cranky, uh, defeated soul when I lost vision. And here, uh, people who don't have eyesight from birth or have gotten completely blind and irreversibly so are smiling and being uh, perfect citizens of the world and carrying their weight and others on their shoulders with nary a complaint. And I was like a little spoiled brat and giving up on life when I couldn't see. So uh, it teaches you that how lucky we are and how spoiled we are. Yeah. I guess. So, yeah. yeah that, no, sorry. I was just going to say, uh, looks like mm-hmm. mindfulness defines you. Yeah. 
No, it also, it may define me, but I am, I'm no um, Gandhi, but I was going to say Gandhi, but Gandhi did a lot of naughty things himself. <laughs> so none of us, uh, none of us are saints. We can, we if we have, if we just know that it's important to be mindful, even if five out of the 30 things we do every day can be mindful, it's better than doing all 30 things wrong. So uh, I am hoping that, my last two years have taught me to be a better human being. And I tell everybody around me that if I make those mistakes I used to make before, or if I do things that are wrong, a true friend, a true mentee, a true co-worker, a true family member, they'll all correct you or at least tell you you're doing something wrong. But we've all become so politically correct. We've all become such uh, 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 sheep. We are not people, we are sheeple that we are so afraid to be honest and earnest and sincere that we're all trying to play the popularity game rather than the sincerity game. And we, we, don't, we don't teach each other to be better humans. We allow monsters to uh, replace the human beings we are friends with. And as they become monsters, we still congratulate them because we enjoy taking the free ride with them to another place or the meal they'll treat us to or the uh, jacket they'll bring us as a gift and because we get something from them, we are, allow, we are allowing ourselves to uh, turn the other side when they do something horribly wrong or when they're supporting the wrong cause or when they're denying another human being the dignity and respect they deserve. So I think I, all of us can just step up and realize we are a human collective before we are one human being. We'll all be better, more mindful human beings and tomorrow will be a better place to live in and better place to breathe in as a human being. Mohan Tara, if there's anything else you want to ask. Uh, Have I bored you enough, Mohan and Tara? No, actually, actually, no. Uh, what I really want to do is to uh, go and listen to the recording and ruminate. Are you, are you bovine? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> In my mind, I'm mentally, yes, I keep ruminating all kinds of things. Uh, Go back so, and <laughs> yes. So that's one, of the, good... one of the things I'm often called is the cunning linguist. <laughs> Tongue in cheek for every for the naughty connotation and the not so naughty connotation. When I when I write, I often write with <laughs> mindfulness. So the when uh, my editors are shocked, Shashi Tharoor reads my column every fortnight, and Shashi will often always give me encouragement and he says Lovely, lovely. I, I, I wait very anxiously for the column on Saturday mornings. I said, really, Shashi? He said, old-fashioned, beautiful writing. I said, okay. So I'm, I'm coming out with a book called Instamatic. And it's the uh, book that I wrote and filmed when I was legally blind. When I could see at most five feet from my left eye, I would take photographs on my iPhone. And those photographs helped me see the world I couldn't see. Because when I brought it to my close to my nose, I could see what I couldn't see with my eyes. And I would see those images and I would write about them. So Instamatic is my uh, uh, book on what I clicked with a camera, the iPhone, and what I thought about when I saw those images as a blind human being. And 80 photographs and 80 essays uh, uh, being released in a, a couple of months. They were being released in March, but we had to cancel the book release. And it's Instamatics, which is a chef's deeper look into the world, Insta world that we live in. And um, I, for me, writing is uh, what became my best friend. And I hope that your readers uh, would will hopefully pick up on this. And it's an age that helps more than anything in life. I always tell people if they just write their thoughts at the end of every day, it cleanses your soul. It's cathartic. It's uh, a therapy session that you've given yourself without having a shrink that you have to pay. Because once you've written those thoughts, they've, from, they've gone from your head and uh, hands into the ether. And you can either read them again or sometimes you don't go back to them for years and maybe never. But those thoughts that are uh, itching you inside, you are pinching you are hurting you are boiling in your blood they've all been written down put down often you forget about them and what was boiling and hurting and pinching and itching all dissipates so if i can uh, do anything to help another person i tell them write every day never to sell a book but just do it for yourself write a diary write in your 
computer and your drafts and your notes, wherever you can write and file it into that cabinet of nothing that nobody else needs to know about. And if you ever want to, sometimes my columns, uh, I'll just like yesterday I was thinking next week I'll write a, co- a column about the difference between joy and happiness. And I realized I'd written a note when I was literally had a stroke and eight days later I was writing it. And I remembered and I went looking for it and I found it by just doing a search on the computer for joy, happiness. And I found that little uh, essay I'd written when I eight days after my stroke. And I found it and now I've expounded on it and I'm writing my next week's column beginning with that. So, you know, I, if um, writing is wonderful and um, that's the one thing that I ruminate over is the ability to have the gift of being able to read, write, hear. And um, so I hope your readers appreciate this gift. You are giving them of sharing thoughts with them and hopefully they'll share theirs in a computer and leave it for the world to read if they care to, or just lock them up with a pass, uh, passcode that nobody else can decipher. Okay. Uh, so, Savir, is there anything else you would like to add uh, to uh, this podcast? Because I think it's the, uh, we've, covered, we've talked about a lot of things and it's been extremely inspirational and extremely um, thought-provoking. Um, there is a food for thought that I'd love to leave your... Uh, audience with. Um, We are what we eat. We are a sum of our experiences. And one of the last final acts of our lives uh, can be an act of generosity and decency and um, sincerity, and that would be organ donation. And uh, when I lost my father at the age of 65, uh, 65, 66, several years ago, 10 years ago, I almost, he died of uh, uh, he died of issues relating from uh, liver failure, and uh, nine years before he died, he'd gotten a, a cadaveric liver in America, and that gave him that new lease of life of nine years. And Papa came back to India and lived a beautiful life till the day he died. And we knew the doctors had told us eight to ten years, and he got nine. We were very grateful, and we wouldn't have gotten those uh, years with him had. Uh, 19-year-old boy who died in America not signed up for giving his organs if he had died uh, in accident, an accident. And because you can sign up for your organs for donation. Not everybody who does that has the good luck of actually helping someone. Very few can actually give even after having signed up for it. In India, there's a pressing need for organs and for organ donations. And I would love to see Indians of all ages, of all ilk, and just signing up with organ donation uh, groups. And just, I, I hope more of us can do that. And if you do that, you can live every day knowing that in your final act on this earth will be an act of kindness and an act of fairness and an act of generosity. So uh, I would love it if you can make this part of your... Uh, uh, every uh, podcast should end with a... Uh, plea to your audience to say, if you haven't signed up, sign up for organ donation. And uh, it's a very important thing to do. If my father got nine years, every other person that deserves more uh, years of living should have that good luck too. And as a nation of a billion plus, we should be hoping more people sign up for it. So this is my shameless plug. And I am sorry that I'm being uh, uh, shamelessly plugging something like this, but I hope people would do that. We would all eat better and live better and be more uh, be happier about ourselves. If you know we've, we are doing that to help another life, if something were to That's happen to your, us. Your plug-in is yeah. much That's appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for <laughs> indulging me. Okay. Uh, so thanks a lot, Savir, for being here. I think we've learned a lot from this and we're, all, I think, all going to go back and re-listen to this and um, think about what, what we what we learned. Um, I'll be doing a proper... Um, a, a conclusion to the podcast which I'll record separately uh, and uh, yep thanks a lot once again and uh, yep. thank you Sabir yeah. thank yeah. you for having me thanks. we hope you enjoyed this second episode of Thinking Like X if you saw value in it subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts Spotify or your favorite podcast app for future episodes You might also enjoy visiting our website 
think.education where think is spelled T-H-I-N-Q. We have various articles, videos and educational materials on inquiry and critical thinking there. You will find links on our website to our social media. You can follow us there to get updates on webinars and courses Think offers. I would like to thank Vedant Chandra for our theme music and Malika Nanda for the design of the podcast image. See you next time.